Welcome to lecture 4.2, Reactive Robot Control Architecture. Robot control that is characterized by sense data being simply mapped to simple actions that work together to achieve tasks is said to have a reactive control architecture. By simply mapped, we mean a long calculation is not required to determine the appropriate action. Frequently, the maps are simple rules like if S, then A. For instance, if a drop-off is detected ahead, stop. This structure is called a finite state machine. A finite state machine models a robot environment world, so together make a world, as consisting of a finite number of states, exactly one of which exists at each moment. State transitions occur from one state to another when some conditions are met. In the case of if S1 then A1, we define a state transition function or map F1 that maps sense event S1 to action A1, which presumably will change the actual state to some usually new state S2. Here is a diagram showing that. We have our state space. The robot and its environment are in one of these states, S1, with the map F1, the state transition function map F1, we are going to say, okay, when you're in state S1, we're going to map via F1 to action A1, which then hopefully and usually is going to change the state of the system from S1 to S2. For simple actions, it is easy to see how these maps work. For more complicated actions, especially those involving long sequences of simple actions, it is not so clear how to go about designing such maps. This is especially true when we consider the frequently large number of possible states in which a robot could be. For every position, orientation, speed, distance from objects, etc., actions must be specified. In other words, the state space is usually large, and if we imagine as designers assigning an action to each state, we see the trouble. There are too many possible states to choose an action for each. In other words, the problem is usually intractable. One approach is to break the state space into subspaces and assign actions to these instead of individual states. But a further complication arises. What if the subspace domains of these maps aren't mutually exclusive? Consider figure 4.3, right here. In the region of overlap, S1 intersect S2, so this region in here, both F1 and F2 apply, leading to different actions A1 and A2. Sometimes there is no conflict, and both actions are desirable and non-conflicting. Other times, only one or the other is desirable, so arbitration is necessary, in which one or the other would be chosen. Finally, sometimes a fusion is desirable, in which the original actions are mixed in some way. For instance, perhaps S1 is the event an object is on the left, and S2 is the event an object is on the right. In, for instance, a corner of a room, both will be true. So the state, S, is an element of this intersection, so it's some element in here, obtains. So we're in, we're in this, this middle region, this intersection. If A1 is continue, and angle right, and A2 is continue and angle left, which seems reasonable, something must be done because there is clearly a conflict here. So one saying 
Uh, so A1 is saying continue and angle to the right. The other one's saying continue and angle to the left. Uh, we are considering the situation where we are running into a corner here. And in this case, uh, neither is really desirable. We could proceed by a simple fusion in which we simply add the two actions, programmatically and not electromechanically, which would waste power and could cause damage to the robot. So we don't want to just have the, the motors fight each other so that we're trying to go in two different directions with the motors themselves. That would be a bad idea. The robot, in, in this case, even if you did it, did it in software, uh, uh, the robot would just continue forward if we were to say, okay, um, in software, we'll just take the sum of these we'll, we'll, um, or average them. Uh, we'll just go straight forward. And of course, in a corner, that would not be the right action. No, instead, we probably want what could be considered a new subspace function and action, or a more complex fusion, something like stop, rotate by some angle, and continue. But even if a designer could go through each subspace and assign it an action in a reasonable amount of design time in this case, which actions and arbitrations thereof should they choose in each state to consistently achieve desired tasks? It's not always obvious. To even further complicate things, the state of the robot must be estimated from measurements, from which it is not always possible to completely or accurately reconstruct the state. And even when it is possible, the estimation process can be model dependent and therefore it may take runtime, okay, when we're actually you know, navigating the robot or manipulating something with the robot, which is something generally discouraged in a reactive control architecture. We're trying to eliminate these long calculations, these involved models. These challenges indicate a systematic design approach. This is provided by the subsumption architecture, which is a type of reactive architecture, to which we now turn. But before we describe its structure, it is worth considering some of its fundamental design principles which we'll do in the next couple sections here. The world is its own best model. <clears throat> the motto from Brooks is the world is its own best model. It is one of the fundamental principles of the subsumption architecture and other reactive architectures as well. The idea here is that it is better to get information about the world from itself than from models thereof. That is measure it and now. This means the subsumption architecture relies very little on models and computation. For instance, consider a robot performing the three action task, T1, A1, action one, pick up an object, A2, action two, open the hatch, and A3, action three, place the object inside. We could reason as follows. When we pick up an object, Open the hatch, then place the object inside. That is, A1 implies we should now do A2, implies we should now do A3. The implicit assumption here is that we know how things will go. But the world is a fickle place, my friend. The object was slippery, and partway through being picked up, which is action A1, it was dropped, and nothing was placed inside. Or, the hatch got stuck during action A2, and our manipulator crashed into it in A3. However, using the principle that the world is its own best model, we would not rely on such finite state machine logic. We would not rely on one state necessarily leading to the next state. Instead, we might use real-time sensor information interpreted as events, say S1 is the event sensed an object to pick up. S2 is the event sensed an object near the hatch. And S3 is sensed the hatch is open. Then events would proceed as follows. If 
S1, if an object is sensed, then pick it up, which should cause S2, which is that the object will be near the hatch, in which case, open the hatch. And this should tell us that the hatch is open, S3, and so then we'll take action A3, which is place the object inside. This is much more resilient. If, for instance, the hatch gets stuck, then not S3. The hatch is not open, so A3, action A3, putting the object inside, won't happen. So if not S3, then therefore not A3. That is, the manipulator would not crash into the hatch. At this point, we can see another way of thinking about this design principle. It is as if communication among the modules that act is channeled through the world itself. Instead of communicating among modules through software or hardware signals, the results of each one's action in the world, environment robot world, are simply there and need no other model. Although this principle was originally developed by the founders of the reactive control architecture, it has really become a general design principle in all robotic control. And let's not kid ourselves, it has its limitations. The most significant limitation is temporal. Sometimes the past and the modeled future are relevant to what actions we would best take now. Furthermore, sensor data is imperfect and incomplete. Although we have said the world is simply there, this is actually a fantasy. We always have to estimate what's going on from measurements. It is more honest to say, it is easier to measure most things than to model them. Doesn't have quite that same snappiness though. Next section, evolution and emergence. The next design principle of the subsumption architecture is start with the simplest actions, i.e. design bottom up. The apparent banality of this is deceiving. It is easy to get stuck thinking about high level behaviors when we begin designing. While we cannot forget that these are the goal, in a subsumption architecture and beyond, the simplest actions are first. The next principle is related. Iteratively include more actions, debugging along the way. The idea is to try to form more complex tasks by including more actions. How might these actions combine? The following design principle begins to answer this question. Higher actions can override lower ones. We mean higher in a sense already alluded to, but which will become much more precise in the next section. Given our bottom-up approach, lower levels are designed early and higher levels are designed later. In this sense, the subsumption architecture design process follows biological evolution, which starts simply, builds incrementally, and overrides selectively. Finally, consider the final design principle. Complex tasks emerge from combinations of simpler actions. This is a sort of promise that complexity can be achieved by following these design principles. It is reasonable to expect emergence. Given the success of this architecture in many robot applications, it seems well-founded. And now the subsumption architecture itself, the thing itself. The subsumption architecture uses a type of finite state machine, or FSM, model. Transition functions map subsets of the state space among each other, just as we looked at above. Design proceeds incrementally by module, also known as layer, each of which contains one or usually several state transition function definitions. A layer is designed to achieve a task like stand up or drive forward or wander. Layers are stacked up with the higher layers having two privileged capabilities over lower layers. Suppression is the first. 
A higher layer can suppress or turn off one or more of the lower layer's inputs. The second, inhibition. A higher layer can inhibit or turn off one or more of a lower layer's outputs. Okay, important. This provides a great deal of flexibility in the design process. For instance, consider a mobile robot with two layers, a layer L1, which is wander, okay, and a higher layer, L2, avoid obstacles. Most likely it will be necessary for L2, the avoid obstacles layer, to inhibit at least some of the outputs of L1, with L2 doing its best impersonation of Jesus, taking the wheel, if you will. Similar reactive architectures. It is worth mentioning that many reactive architectures have been developed from some or all of the principles of the subsumption architecture. In particular, the behavior-based architecture of Lecture 4.4 is a direct extension thereof. Others, such as SMASH, which is a, a, a robot operating system or ROS module, uh, will be introduced um, in a later uh, chapter in part two. Smash uses what is called a hierarchical state machine that has several advantages. It's a little bit easier to work with and it's a little bit easier to keep track of everything that's happening in your design. So this is the reactive control architecture for robots and obviously there's a lot to it but um, this is a little bit of an introduction. It's very popular, very powerful technique. All right, thanks.